Module 2, Approaches to Curriculum Planning and Processes. Hi, this is Dr. Davis, and here we are in our second session together. We're going to be looking at the uh, approaches to how curriculum is developed in this uh, particular presentation. So we're going to look at five uh, approaches that are commonly used to design curriculum, but then we're also going to look at some of the planning processes that are used to get ready to develop curriculum. So we're looking at two broad areas this week and uh, hopefully this will be helpful to you as you see how the curriculum is developed at the school where you work or the school district where you work. Our approach to curriculum reflects our perceptions, values, and knowledge. A curriculum approach reflects a holistic position or a, a meta-orientation encompassing curriculum's foundations, for other words, a person's philosophy, view of history, view of psychology, and learning theory, and view of social issues, curriculum domains, common important knowledge within the field and curriculum theory and practice. An approach expresses a viewpoint about curriculum's development and design. The role of the learner, teacher, and curriculum specialist in planning a curriculum. The curriculum's goals and important issues that must be examined. A curriculum approach reflects our views of schools and society. By understanding our curriculum approach and that of our school or our school district, it is possible to conclude whether our professional view conflicts with the formal organizational view. Although schools, over time, tend to commit to a particular curriculum approach, many educators are not strongly committed to one approach. Rather, they emphasize one approach in some situations and advocate other approaches in other situations. Curriculum textbook writers sometimes adhere to more than one curriculum approach. Curriculum specialists even curriculum students must examine their approaches. Curriculum approaches can be viewed from a technical slash scientific or non-technical slash non-scientific perspective. Technical scientific approaches coincide with traditional theories and models of education and reflect established formal methods of schooling. Non-technical and non-scientific approaches evolved as part of an avant-garde and experimental philosophies and politics, and they tend to challenge established formalized education practices and be more fluid and emergent. We are going to look at uh, five of these curriculum approaches curriculum design and development approaches. The first three that we're going to look at may be classified as technical or scientific, and the last two as non-technical and non-scientific. Rooted in the University of Chicago School, and really the work of Franklin Bobbitt and W.W. W. Charters to Ralph Tyler and Hilda Taba, the behavioral approach is the oldest and still dominant approach to curriculum. Logical and prescriptive, it relies on technical and scientific principles and includes paradigms and models and step-by-step -step strategies for formulating curriculum. This approach is normally based on a plan, sometimes called a blueprint or a document. Goals and objectives are specified. Content and activities are sequenced to coincide with the objectives and learning outcomes and are evaluated in uh, relation to the goals and objectives. This curriculum approach, which has been applied to all subjects since the early 1920s, constitutes a frame of reference against which other approaches to curriculum are compared. This approach has also been called logical, conceptual empiricist, experientialist, rational scientific, and technocratic. The behavioral approach started with the idea of efficiency, influenced by business and industry and the scientific movement theories of Frederick Taylor. 
who analyzed factory efficiency in terms of time and motion studies and concluded that each worker should be paid on the basis of his or her individual output as measured by the number of units produced in a specified period of time. Efficient operation of schools became a major goal in the 1920s. Ensuring efficiency in schools often meant eliminating small classes, increasing student-teacher ratios, hiring fewer administrators, reducing teacher salaries, maintaining or reducing operational costs, and so on, and then preparing charts and graphs to show the resultant cost reductions. Raymond Callahan later branded this approach as the cult of efficiency. The goal was to reduce teaching and learning to precise behaviors with corresponding measurable activities. Bobbitt set out to organize a course of studies for the elementary grades. He said, we need principles of curriculum making. We did not know that we should first determine objectives from the study of social needs. We had not learned that plans are means, not ends. He developed his approach in the early 1920s in his work entitled How to Make a Curriculum, in which he outlined more than 800 objectives, let me repeat that, 800 objectives, and related activities to coincide with predetermined student needs. These activities ranged from teeth and eye care, to keeping home appliances in good condition, to spelling and grammar. Bobbitt's methods were sophisticated for his day. However, taken out of context, his machine analogy and his list of hundreds of objectives and activities were easy to criticize. It was left to Tyler, that's Ralph Tyler, who took a number of Bobbitt's courses at the University of Chicago to reorganize the need for behavioral objectives that were not so small or lockstep. He combined basic techniques of curriculum, instruction, and evaluation into a simple plan. Tyler advocated using a school or a school district's philosophy in making decisions about objectives. Tyler approached combined behaviorism, which is objectives were important, with progressivism, where the learner's needs were also important. Tyler was influenced by Edward Thorndike and John Dewey, and the scientific movement of curriculum making during the 30 years prior to his classic text. Today, few educational behaviorists continue the tradition of Ivan Pavlov's and, and John Watson's stimulus response theories, but many formulate precise objectives and evaluate programs according to those objectives. Urging accountability plans, outcome-based education, and standards-based education, many still rely on direct instruction, practice and drill, monitoring student and prompt feedback. Behaviorism has evolved over the years to address the complexities of human and learning. It now allows for research that investigates the mind's depths. Most behaviors educators now perceive learners as cognitive individuals functioning within a social context. Individual students experience and respond to the same curriculum in different ways depending on their cultural interpretation and their prior life experiences. Later on, we'll look at what's called the theory of variation, which will explain why they respond in different ways. The behavioral approach to a curriculum with its dependency on technical means of selecting and organizing curriculum is likely to continue to serve us well into the future. Reminiscent of organizational theory, the managerial approach considers the school as a social system in which students, teachers, curriculum specialists, and administrators interact. Educators who rely on this approach plan the curriculum in terms of programs and schedules, space, resources and equipment, and personnel. This approach advocates selecting, organizing, communicating with, and supervising people involved in curriculum decisions. Consideration is given to committee and group processes, human relations, leadership styles and methods, and decision making. 
an offshoot of the behavioral approach, the managerial approach also relies on a plan, rational principles, and logical steps. It tends to focus on a curriculum's supervisory and administrative aspects, especially the organizational and implementation process. Advocates of the managerial approach are interested in the in innovation and in how curriculum specialists, supervisors, and administrators can facilitate change. The curriculum specialist or supervisor, sometimes the same person, is considered a practitioner, not a theorist, a change agent, resource person, and facilitator. This person reports to an administrator or administration and adheres to the school's mission and goals. The school may resist or support change. If the school is innovative or reform-minded, then the school culture tends to create and sustain a culture for change. If the school emphasizes the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, the curriculum specialist introduces plans accordingly. Managers communicate a desire for change or stability to subordinates. The managerial approach is rooted in the organizational and administrative school model of the early 1900s, a period that combined a host of innovative plans involving curriculum and instruction that centered around individualization, departmentalization, non-grading, classroom grouping, homeroom, and work-study activities. It was an era when superintendents introduced school district plans to modify schools' horizontal and vertical organization. The plan names usually selected uh, the school district's name or organizational concept as in an example here, the Batavia New York plan, the Denver plan, the Portland plan, the platoon plan, a study hall plan, etc. Superintendents and associate superintendents were involved in curriculum leadership, often developing a plan in one school district and also implementing it in another. Many administrators combined managerial and curriculum leadership skills. The managerial approach became the dominant curriculum approach in the 1950s and 1960s. During this period, principals were seen as curriculum leaders, instructional leaders, and managers. Midwest school administrators and professors with administrative background dominated the field of curriculum in setting policies and priorities, establishing the direction of change, planning and organizing curriculum, and carrying out instruction. The administrators were politically active. They used supervisory and curriculum associations and their respective journals and yearbooks as platforms for their ideas. Many such as William Alexander, and Robert Anderson, and Leslie Bishop, Gerald Firth, Arthur Lewis, John McNeil, and J. Lloyd Trump became curriculum professors at major universities. Others became active as board directors and executive committee members of professional organizations that had major impact on curriculum, supervision, and administration. Many published curriculum books that expressed their managerial views. These school administrators were less concerned about the content than about organization and implementation. They were less concerned about the subject matter, methods, and materials than about improving curriculum in light of policies, plans, and people on a system-wide basis. They envisioned curriculum changes as they administered resources and restructured schools. Many of today's ideas about school reform and restructuring derive from the 1950s and 1960s. A current emphasis on standards and high-stakes testing reflects an earlier emphasis on state control of schools, many current plans related to school-based management and empowerment are based on the previous eras, career ladder, team teaching, and differential staffing models. Much of the new legislative and administrative support for improving curriculum and instruction is based on the changing roles of the superintendent and principal as curriculum and instructional leaders that blossomed during the 1950s and 60s. 
A managerial view that emphasizes organizing people and policies led to an emphasis on organizing curriculum into a system. The organization's units and subunits are viewed in relation to the whole. The curriculum plan often entails organizational diagrams, flowcharts, and committee structures. Sometimes referred to as a cur as curriculum inter engineering, the approach includes the processes by which engineers, such as superintendents, directors, coordinators, and principals, plan the curriculum. The curriculum stages, i.e. development, design, implementation, and evaluation, and the curriculum's structures, subjects, courses, unit plans, and lesson plans. Systems theory, systems analysis, and systems engineering influence the system's approach to curriculum. The school managers widely employ concepts developed by social scientists when they discuss administrative and organizational theory. The military, business, and industry uh, use the systems approach to ensure that people master the tasks they must perform. In the systems approach to curriculum, the parts of the school or school district are examined in terms of their interrelatedness. Departments, personnel, equipment, and schedules are planned to change people's behavior. Information is usually communicated to administrators who then consider the choices. Currently, many schools use a systems approach known as total quality management based on Edward Deming's 14 points for improving the system in which people work. This approach, also drawn from industry, represents a paradigm shift emphasizing client priority, in our case students, extensive data collection and analysis, self-monitoring and inspection, collaboration, communication, cooperation, and team responsibility. When applying total quality management to curriculum development and implementation, participants realize that their function depends on acquiring and applying what is called profound knowledge. Such knowledge is based on four components, systematic thinking, theory of variation, theory of knowledge, and theory of psychology. Systematic thinking enables people to realize that their actions interact with others' actions and that the total organization entails the dynamic interaction of many sub-processes. The theory of variation recognizes that curriculum activity entails common and special causes and effects. A school is a community in which people exhibit individual differences. They must learn to communicate, cooperate, respect others' opinions, and reach a consensus. According to the theory of knowledge, the knowledge possessed by the people within the system is essential to curricular success. The knowledge of psychology supports total quality management by optimizing the participation and learning of students and teachers. To use this approach successfully, individuals must understand, respect, and care for one another. George Beauchamp describes the first systems theory of curriculum. He postulated five equally important components of education, administration, counseling, curriculum, instruction, and evaluation. Many professors of education, especially those outside of curriculum, do not accept this notion of equal components. They view their own field, say, in administration as the most important. For example, school administrators often delegate supervisors to take care of curriculum matters, especially if the administrators view their leadership role as chiefly managerial. Curriculum specialists usually view curriculum as a major component and see related fields such as teaching, instruction, and supervision as subsystems that help implement the curriculum. However, Beauchamp was not trying to convey that the 
five components of education draw their ideas from psychology, sociology, history, philosophy, and so on. In any event, practitioners should use whichever procedures are most helpful and applicable in the real world. Curriculum specialists who value the systems approach view curriculum broadly and are concerned with the curriculum issues relevant to the entire school or school system, not just particular subjects or grades. They are concerned with theory in which the curriculum is related across different programs and content areas. The extent to which the curriculum reflects the school's or even the school system's organization, the participants' needs and training, and various methods for monitoring and evaluating results. Long-term planning is focused with short-term or incidental planning. Sometimes referred to as the traditional, encyclopedic, synoptic, intellectual, or knowledge-oriented approach, the academic approach attempts to analyze and synthesize major positions, trends, and concepts in curriculum. This approach tends to be historical and philosophical, and to a lesser degree, social and practical. The discussion of curriculum development is usually scholarly and theoretical, and concerned with many broad aspects of schooling, including the study of education. The academic approach has partly returned to current focus on the nature and structure of knowledge as current curriculum specialists address curriculum from a postmodern academic perspective. Attention is now on understanding how knowledge can be constructed, deconstructed, and then reconstructed. As William Pinar noted, academics and schools must strive to comprehend the field of curriculum. However, it is doubtful that the academic approach will become popular among practitioners. The academic approach to curriculum addresses much more than subject matter and pedagogy. Academics cover numerous foundational topics, usually historical and philosophical, social and political topics. Thus presenting an overview of curriculum, they consider areas of study not usually included in curriculum, deliberation, and action, such as religion and psychotherapy, literary, literary criticism, and linguistics. To many educators, such fields seem very foreign at first. However, educators are beginning to realize the need to perceive curriculum as diverse discourse. Everyone involved in the academic approach to curriculum is in the business of words and ideas. Some curriculum leaders contend that the preceding approaches are too technocratic and rigid. They contend that the curricularists who try to be scientific and rational miss the personal and social aspects of curriculum and instruction, ignore subject matters, artistic, physical, and cultural aspects, rarely consider the need for self-reflectiveness and self-actualization among learners, and overlook the socio-psychological dynamics of classroom and schools. This view is rooted in progressive philosophy and the child-centered movement of the early 1900s. Mainly at the elementary school level, curriculum activities emerged from this approach, including lessons based on life experiences, group games, group projects, artistic endeavors, dramatizations, field trips, social enterprises, learning and interest centers, and homework and tutoring sessions, or what we might call learning corners or learning centers. These activities include creative problem solving and active student participation. They emphasize socialization and life adjustment for students, as well as a stronger family tie and social a school community ties. They, all, they are representative of Parker, Dewey, Kilpatrick, and Carlton uh, Wash, 
Burns Ideal School and the kinds of curriculum activities they put into practice. Such, such activities are still practiced at the Parker School in Chicago, Dewey's Lab School at the University of Chicago, Washburn School District in Winnetka, Illinois, Kilpatrick's Lincoln School of Teachers College, Columbia University, and many other private and university lab schools, and some recent charter schools. Various developmental theories, i.e. those of Frederick Erickson, Robert ha Havinghurst, and Abraham Maslow, and child-centered methods, such as those of Friedrich Froebel and Johann Pestalozzi and A.S. Neal, uh, for curriculum derive from the humanistic approach, which considers informal as well as formal curricula. This approach considers the whole child, not only the cognitive dimension. The arts, the humanities, and health education are just as important as science and math. Curriculum specialists who believe in this approach tend to put faith in cooperative learning, independent learning, small group learning, and social activities, as opposed to competitive, teacher-dominated, large group learning. Each child has considerable input into the curriculum and shares responsibility with parents, teachers, and curriculum specialists in planning classroom instruction. In schools that adopt this approach, curriculum leaders and supervisors tend to permit teachers more input into curriculum decisions and ideas of professional collegiality and mentor systems are more pronounced. Curriculum committees are bottom-up instead of top-down, and the students often are invited into the curriculum meetings to express their views. The humanistic approach became popular again in the 1970s as relevancy, radical school reform, open education, and alternative education became part of the education's reform movement. Today, however, demands for educational excellence and academic productivity have resulted in an emphasis on cognition, not humanism, and on subjects such as science and math rather than art and music. Nonetheless, the humanistic approach may again may gain adherence as people come to realize the interdependence of cognition and affect. Education must focus on both the personal and interpersonal and requires overcoming a long tradition of regarding cognition as something separate from feeling. To be sure, the student's self-concept, self-esteem, and personal identity are essential factors in learning, which involve social and moral, not just cognitive aspects. To some curriculum scholars, the reconceptualist approach to curriculum largely extends the humanistic approach. Others argue that reconceptualization or reconceptualism is concerned chiefly with change and reform. Still others argue that reconceptualists lack an approach because they lack a model for developing and designing curriculum. Some curricularists who associate with the reconceptualists camp contend that there is no one precise certain way to create curricula. Curriculum development is more like a communal conversation. Curriculum is developed is not a closed system but remains open. Reconceptualists are interested in curricula, curricula's interactions with political, economic, social, moral, and artistic forces. They see the school as an extension of society and students as capable of changing society, becoming change agents. Many reconceptualists see current curricula as overly controlling and designed to preserve the existing social order and its inequities. Reconceptual reconceptualists have brought a greater diversity to curricular dialogue. Reconceptualism is rooted in the philosophy and social activism of such early reconstructionists such as George Count, Harold Rugg, and Harold Benjamin. Like today's reconceptualists, these scholars urged curriculists to rethink curriculum. However, reconceptualists and many are more likely to speak in terms of inequity, discrimination, and oppression, for example, with regard to class, gender, and race.
In the curriculum planning process, you'll see very quickly that there are four stages, or four levels where curriculum is developed. Beginning in the upper right-hand side of this particular slide, number nine, you'll see that uh, there's a national state, local, and classroom level. I put a little slinky up there in that top right-hand corner to let you know that uh, many of these levels are interrelated. So here's the overarching question. Take a look at the diagram. This graphic Pro that I have here represents a behavioral approach to curriculum. Why? Now I've given you a hint here because I ask who developed the Common Core standards? Well, by now you, you certainly know the answer is that this is a behavioral process because it is a top-down process. And the hint is that the Common Core Standards, which is the current curriculum uh, for uh, public schools in the United States, and, and while 40 states have ratified them and are using them, they've modified them slightly, but they're based on standards that were developed by the uh, National Governors Association. And so it was done at a national level. So that's why the slinky is in the top left. And you can imagine the slinky is going from top to the next state, the state level, the local level, and then finally down to the classroom. So no matter where you start in this process, ultimately, curriculum, the planning for curriculum, has to take a classroom focus because that is the level where it is implemented. It may be defined at the national level and it may be refined by each state as Alabama has done in its college and career ready standards which is its form of the Common Core Standards. And each district may, may give it its flavor. But ultimately, it is in the classroom where curriculum finds its implementation. And therefore, the classroom has to be a part of this process. Because it is classroom teachers that are going to have to implement it. And while it may look good on paper at the national level, and oftentimes many of the standards do, and many of the strategies look great on paper when you're looking at it from a very high altitude, such as the national level, but where the rubber meets the road, which is in the classroom, it's a far different story. And teachers have to make adjustments to the curriculum in order to implement it. Because as we will find, and as we have found, with the theory of variation, you may have a standardized curriculum, but its interpretation and its implementation may be different from school to school to school. So within a district, you have one elementary curriculum, but the way it is implemented is different in, say, a Title I school versus a more affluent school. And it is probably going to appear different when you're in a very rural population, a rural school district, versus a city school district. So the process that you'll see here is that standards are identified. And, and those are the targets that must be met in the classroom. So while it flows from the, the national level down to the classroom, it is the classroom teacher that is responsible for achieving those standards and those objectives. And so he or she in, in the classroom must be able to take what is given to them and then translate it into learning that the student will, will uh, master. And then really each district decides which tools are going to be used in order to uh, meet the standards, in order to convey the information, the content of the curriculum. And, and again, while they may have the same standards, different textbooks are used. And really different teaching strategies are used because that's the amazing thing about having standards the foundation is the same, but how you 
bear it out in the classroom is going to be very, very different. And teachers use different teaching styles. They use different textbooks. They use different videos. They use all kinds of different ancillary materials as well as activities. And that's what makes curriculum planning such an engaging pursuit because it is the planner that has to to prepare the material that teachers will then turn into instruction and use in their classroom. Curriculum is not one of those activities, I guess for lack of a better word, that exists in a vacuum that is not touched by outside forces. And really there's very little in the classroom of the 21st century that doesn't feel the effects of outside forces uh, that shape it, that change it. And, and really that's important because it is those outside forces that take something such as curriculum and make it something useful. So here on slide number 10 I've given you some uh, forces that shape curriculum and change it. Now we've already talked about the history of curriculum development and, and really what has changed in society that have impacted the curriculums that we use. So let's look at those societal changes. When you had mass immigration to the United States, that meant that schools needed to address people from other countries and help them to become Americans. That's learn a language, learn a history, learn a culture. And so those societal forces certainly shape the, uh, the curriculum that we use. Let's not forget that textbook companies also shape curriculum because remember there's only about four states that determine the content of the textbook and those states being New York, Florida, Texas, and California. And the reason why those states exert so much pressure on what is printed in textbooks, the topics that are covered, the order that it's covered, is because of one thing. Where do they sell the textbooks? California, Texas, Florida, and New York. Where you sell a lot of textbooks, those states can ask for specific things to be taught in certain orders and, and certain uh, ancillary materials provided. And so what the rest of us get then is pretty much textbooks that are written for four states. And while we may have an Alabama history book, but the reality is all of the other books pretty much uh, follow what California wants, what New York, Florida, and Texas want. Education itself shapes the curriculum. And this would be, say, at the Department of Education level within a state or at the national level, Department of Education in Washington, D.C. They have an agenda for what they want schools to, to be, just as society determines what it needs from its schools, and that's the pressure that it puts on curriculum. The political forces through the Department of Education have to meet certain mandates as well. On the opposite side of that is the political side of things, where you have a more conservative political agenda, as we are, are having now in uh, Washington, D.C., a much more conservative outlook on, on life and on the country. That's going to shape our schools to a great deal and the curriculum that is found within them. The courts also play an important role in shaping curriculum as, as precedents from legal actions have uh, mandated that uh, curriculum uh, and, and topics be covered in, in school. So they play an important role in also who has access to what curriculum. Remember that we're, we're talking about uh, IDEA and who should have access to the general curriculum as well as pull out programs. Certainly test companies uh, help to define curriculum because uh, what is taught is tested and, and what ends up on tests often ends up in books and ends up in the classroom. It is just a fact of life. As much as we would like the teachers to have a lot of control over what they teach, so teaching to the test is no stranger to uh, many classroom teachers and uh, the tests you would hope would match what's taught in the classroom. Uh, and then finally business 
certainly drives curriculum development as they identify the type of workers that they need for their businesses. So uh, curriculum is like many things in education, pulled and pushed by many forces uh, within our country that shape it to be what is needed at the moment. In the process of curriculum development, I've already established that the classroom level is probably the most important level of, of this process. Remember starting at the national level and going all the way on down to the classroom level. But the question is, that, is it really the most important level? When you consider the process of curriculum development, really nothing of development truly happens at the classroom level. Now, now consider this. In the behaviorist approach, uh, it is a top-down approach so that really the important decisions are made at other levels. Let's think about this. Standards are adopted uh, at the state level they're developed at the national level. Textbooks are chosen at the local level, maybe at a school level. Objectives are determined at uh, state levels for sure, and probably a little bit at the local level. Alignment is achieved at the state level. Sequences outlined at the state level. Pacing guides are probably completed at a district level. So when you really think about this, what of the curriculum development process is done at the classroom level? And simply, it's the implementation. Now that might, for some, be the most important aspect of curriculum de development is the uh, implementation. So when we look at this, we look at two dimensions then. We look at the perception of curriculum development, which we want to perceive happens at the classroom level, but in reality, it's, it's happening at other levels and at other places. So really what is happening at the classroom level is the implementation of the curriculum and really not much more than, than that. We could ask ourselves a question though, if the most important aspect of curriculum development happens in a classroom is the implementation, then really we have to say the classroom teacher is a de facto developer of curriculum because the designer of the curriculum at the national level, those who have determined the standards, are still uh, at the mercy, if I can use that term, of the classroom teacher because it is the classroom teacher that determines the implementation. It's the rubber meeting the road. Think of that picture in your mind. But it is the classroom teacher that determines what of that curriculum that gets implemented in the classroom and how it gets implemented implemented. You see, it is the classroom teacher that makes decisions about what is taught and the order that it's taught in. Even though the state or the, the national curriculum designers that designed the standards and even at the state level where they s sequence it, still it is that classroom teacher who makes those ultimate decisions about you know I'm gonna teach this standard before that standard because even though I know this is the the direction it came in I realize that the class I have today is not going to be able to handle that and so I need to make some changes so really when you think about the changes that are, are made by classroom teachers in order of how the material is presented, they in turn then become classroom uh, curriculum designers. And let's also think about the other things that these people do. I mean, they're choosing materials that are used along with the, the curriculum, and they're determining the activities that are going to be used to uh, convey those standards. So really, this step of implementation and the control that the teacher has over it is far greater than the curriculum designers probably intended or at least 
understood. Uh, they, they may think that the uh, teachers are going to teach the curriculum just as it is written. And you'll hear this often. You know, we're teaching to fidelity. We're teaching it as, as if there was no difference between what the curriculum designer had intended and what the teacher wants to do. But the reality is that that does not happen uh, in every classroom every day. What happens in the school then when it comes to curriculum development? A lot of these decisions about curriculum uh, may not necessarily happen at the classroom level. Now I said it was the most important level, but I want to, to be sure that I underscore here that uh, many cases uh, curriculum development is put in the hands of not just one teacher but a group of teachers discipline specific groups at the high school secondary level or grade level teams at the elementary level are charged with uh, making decisions about uh, how that curriculum is implemented for example uh, in in s several schools uh, these grade level teams or, or discipline group teams decide what content is to be presented and in what order it's going to be presented and, and they actually get down to the the level of okay this week we're all going to be presenting this content we're going to use specific activities to make that happen uh, there's an elementary school in Brundage and, and one in Troy that uses a very similar concept to make sure that the students in multiple grades are getting that same content same strategies, same uh, intensive instruction using RTI. And, and really uh, this, this uh, level of uh, implementation is even used with diverse learning populations where they're working in tandem with the uh, whole group as, as well as these uh, small groups and, and making sure that that instruction is the same. And, and then of course we have to consider that uh, the standards have to be aligned with departmental goals and objectives as well as school goals and objectives. So then those teachers become very important to the process of determining uh, the materials that are to be used and the instructional strategies that have to be used in order to convey that material. And then finally they are given that opportunity to evaluate the success of the programs, the success of the lessons, and what needs to be retaught or uh, what needs to be modified to help the students. Beyond the classroom and, and really the grade level or discipline group uh, committees, we have building levels. Uh, at the building level, we have curriculum development going on. And usually those kinds of uh, curricular decisions involve uh, programmatic decisions. And they're the administrators and faculty are looking at uh, maybe what new programs need to be added to the, the school's curriculum and what programs to delete. Although I must add that in, in many cases it seems that it's new programs to be added and seldom do they delete any existing programs. And usually in order to make the curricular decisions at this level, uh, leaders will involve uh, the parents uh, and maybe even a few students, but certainly uh, stakeholders and faculty in in getting some opinions about what needs to change what what needs to stay the same uh, typically curriculum evaluations happen at this building level and uh, they use the annual testing or quarterly testing to gather data about where is the school uh, strong what areas uh, do they need to improve on so it's a more holistic approach uh, to looking at uh, defining curriculum by uh, the data that the school has and then of course uh, decisions once uh, deficiencies are identified then decisions have to be made uh, to correct those weaknesses correct those deficiencies and faculty and and, and some stakeholders are involved in that process of uh, 
making adjustments to the curriculum. So this is even considered a, a curricular activity at the building level. While it's not as, as detailed as what may happen at the grade level or in the classroom, it certainly is a macro view of a curriculum uh, adjustments curriculum development or design and certainly at this level we see other curricular activities related to accreditation and the choice of textbooks and any ancillary materials that need to be purchased to go along with those those textbooks so the building level is not exempt from uh, the process of planning the curriculum it is just a, a more generalized uh, process at this level at the district level, or what in that chart I showed you, the local level, again we see program uh, issues discussed. Again, addition of uh, programs, deletion of ineffective programs. Again, these are more initiative-driven uh, programs. And certainly uh, district leaders, along with school principals, are sitting around uh, reviewing the uh, Alabama scorecards and uh, the achievement for the district uh, so that they can see where the strengths are in the district's curriculum and and how they are doing in relation to other other districts and other schools certainly uh, grant writing is taking place at this this level to fund new initiatives and new programs and of course district leaders are responsible for uh, gathering the data uh, that supports uh, how the students are doing in relation to the curriculum certainly superintendents uh, must monitor the compliance with state and federal regulations and and this involves even curriculum too uh, to a certain degree uh, how how much fidelity I mentioned that previously you know there is the call for maintaining that fidelity to the curriculum as presented and and certainly a, a wise superintendent is going to make sure that they are in compliance with with those standards and the standards are being taught that the standards are being posted if that's that's a requirement for your school district Evaluation happens at the district level and then, of course, flows out to the schools from there. The state, of course, has its uh, evaluation programs and it's an annual uh, program, the continuous improvement process that they have, and uh, that is has a big impact on school districts certainly accreditation visits as I've said uh, at the uh, the building level uh, happen at the district level and districts are involved in those and, and sometimes uh, there is a need to reorganize schools and and districts are, are taken over by the state uh, Department of Education to remedy some ongoing challenges that are not not addressed so uh, these decisions that impact curriculum and, and how the curriculum must be adjusted to meet them happen at this district level. Uh, new plans, plan for uh, a new type of school, reorganizing a school within a school certainly have to be uh, discussed at this level. Curriculum development at the state level is very different from what you see at the previous two levels of classroom and uh, building or even at the, the local level. The process here is uh, much more limited to uh, in, in number of people who are involved in the process. Uh, certainly the state level uh, is, is focusing on leadership of the schools, which that has been delegated to school districts. Uh, there is a administrative rules that are adopted at the state level and then those are used to guide local districts, local education agencies in uh, what must be done when it comes to curriculum. So the standards are published at this level and uh, their responsibility is to monitor school districts and look at compliance issues. Money is, is a big part of what happens at the state level. That money, of course, is distributed to uh, the local level uh, districts, and that would be state and federal money. Uh, the Department of Education here is is giving general guidance to uh, the districts as to how the curriculum is to be implemented uh, 
uh, times, uh, uh, the amount of time spent in particular content areas is addressed by the, uh, the state board. Uh, they're going to set standards for graduation, courses that have to be taken, or credits that have to be accumulated. And then uh, any assessments that are used to measure the outcome of, of the curriculum, those are all determined at the state level. And uh, then, then, of course, local districts are given uh, that guidance in order to take it down to their individual building levels. At the national level, curriculum development gets a little more dicey. The Tenth Amendment of the United States Constitution uh, informs us that education is a state concern. While it doesn't say that in, in those words, the implication is clear. Uh, the powers not given to the federal government are reserved by the states, and education is one of those areas in which the federal government has taken no direct responsibility. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not interested in what goes on in education, but they have no direct responsibility over it. Of course, Founding Fathers realized that it was the local uh, states that had probably the greatest impact on education because they were closest to the students. But the national level does uh, involve a, a large sum of money that is then, of course, distributed to the various states. And those are for programs and projects that the states are are required to implement or mandated to implement and the money that goes along with those. Of course, No Child Left Behind grants, which have now been replaced by uh, the Every Child Succeed Act. Uh, we haven't seen what those grants are going to be, but certainly within a year now those, those grants are going to be available for states to compete for. Of course, Race to the Top grants and other projects uh, are under the control of the Department of Education in Washington, D.C. Other than the standards uh, that, that would be adopted at a national level uh, through the, the National Governors Association, the federal government is really silent on, on curriculum. Uh, they will provide programs for uh, money for programs that are important and, and address national concerns, societal concerns. But still, it is the state and then the local level that has the, the lion's share of responsibility for developing the curriculum that the students experience. Government is not the only agency that uh, has an impact on curriculum development, curriculum design. Certainly the professional organizations out there do impact what uh, we consider the content. And you have the National Education Association, American Federation of Teachers, the uh, National Math Teachers Association or History Teachers Association, all of these have uh, certainly had their their share of impact on the curriculum as we know it. And certainly they are ones who are charged with the responsibility for determining what needs to be taught within each of the disciplines and at what kind of sequence is involved. In 1893, the Committee of Ten report, which was a report uh, from a committee chaired by uh, the president of Harvard at the time, and uh, really under the auspices of the National Education Association, and uh, they, they are really the ones that identified the nine areas that were a part of secondary curriculum. And that also was uh, revised in the Cardinal Principles of Secondary Education in 1918. So the professional organizations uh, play an important role in uh, determining and defining a broad content that the governmental agencies use to craft into standards that are presented in the classroom. So there is a connection for these professional organizations as well. An important part of the curriculum process asks the question, so once you've designed the curriculum, how often should it be evaluated? And 
Is it something that we need to do every year? Is it something that we need to do every three years? And really what the experts suggest is that the evaluation process should be ongoing. It should be done every year. And uh, that may be anecdotally completed or it may be internally completed, uh, but this is something that should be done on an annual basis, but certainly formal evaluation every three years. And in that way, you begin to see the trends that are developing. One year, while it is informative, it does not give us the the depth of what's really going on here. You know, things happen from year to year. But over a period of uh, three years, you begin to see some, some trends. And, and I know that schools make changes uh, in, in programs every year because they look at the data and the data says, oh, things aren't going well in our math program, so let's come up with a new program. But I think if they were to, to undertake a formal evaluation every three years, they would see the, that there are going to be rising scores and falling scores, dips in the data as it were, but that those tend to even out. Now certainly after uh, three years, five years even, you begin to, to see that this is a progression and something needs to be done. But I know that, that there are districts that try to do an annual evaluation, but more likely the three-year evaluation is, is to be uh, more effective. When we conduct an evaluation, of course, the question falls to, so who's supposed to be involved in this process? I've got some, some groups of people here on slide number 20, and should students and teachers, parents, leaders, and community be involved? And the answer to that question is yes, everyone should be involved, even students, because they are the end user of the curriculum, and they are the ones most impacted by it. So uh, they, they should be involved in uh, curricular decisions and, and decisions that are related to evaluation. It, it is a... Uh, comprehensive process to evaluate curriculum and we'll look at the evaluation in much greater detail in, in a later module but just suffice it to say that this should be everybody's responsibility to evaluate the curriculum and to see that it's doing what it intends to do that it was designed to do these people need to be a, at the table where that decision is made when you consider the process for designing curriculum a uh, question often arises, do you use a team approach? And we see that in the uh, managerial model or managerial approach to curriculum design. We see it even in, in behavioral uh, approaches as well as the humanistic approach to curriculum development. What should that team look like? And this on slide 21 is an example. It is not the authoritative end all uh, form of a team structure, but it does give us an example of uh, how uh, we, we go about and process through the designing of the curriculum. And you will see that uh, this model is is very much a managerial model because we're looking at teams and uh, designing the structure of the team around the work that needs to be done. So the the lead team would be, uh, I use the term lead team, the leadership team would be the group that is responsible for the entire process, much like a, a steering committee. Uh, would guide through a, a process, a very complicated process, and curriculum design is a very complicated process. The, the leadership team would be the team responsible for uh, getting the process started, charging uh, the other committees with their work. And uh, then underneath them you have two separate committees, one on the front end and one on the back end, and that front end would be the coordinating committee. They would have really direct responsibility for the work of other design teams and they would be the ones that other teams would uh, report to. Evaluation committee of course would be the committee at the end of the process that looks at how well the uh, curriculum functioned. 
And we're not going to really talk about that evaluation committee at this particular point. Central to this uh, design process is the data, and that's looking at needs assessments, that's looking at standardized test scores or whatever data you have available to you. That is what drives this curriculum design process and helps these committees to make the decisions that need to be made. And uh, then once that data has been identified and, and organized, then the design committee is charged with the actual creation of the initial curriculum uh, guide or the, the uh, standards and uh, selection of standards and objectives and pacing and guides and other aspects of the curriculum design process. So that design committee has a very important role. They are really the ones that do the, the lion's share of the work of, of developing curriculum. Uh, the program development committee would uh, work very closely with the design committee as they are integrating curriculum into the school's overall program. And they would be responsible for identifying uh, needs that need to, to be met, uh, and that could be ancillary materials, uh, that could also be uh, additional training that needs to take place. They are the ones who uh, really are involved in the implementation of the new curriculum in the school. Then the staff development committee comes alongside and their responsibility of course is to provide any training that would be needed and they would guide the training, they would coordinate the training uh, so that everyone has all of the necessary skills in order to effectively implement the curriculum in their classroom, in their discipline. Lastly, I want to look at what skills are needed in order to work through a curriculum design process. Beginning with, and, and I'm thinking at the building level, beginning with uh, an understanding of change and change process and change theory would be helpful uh, because really new curriculum is a change and uh, people have to be prepared for change. Change is something that many people do not like and do not respond to. So uh, a leader, and, and, and this I go back to the previous slide where we looked at the structure of the team, this would be important for all of those teams to understand uh, the change process and, and what people are going to experience and how they may resist uh, this this new curriculum and so understanding that will help these committees in their work because they'll begin to see where uh, there may be pitfalls and can address them before they become problems uh, having a, a knowledge of interpersonal skills would also be beneficial to the design team and uh, leadership skills of course how to delegate and how to hold people accountable for, for work and, and to meet deadlines would be also another skill that would be uh, necessary to this process. Finally, communication skills uh, would, would be helpful. Uh, I'm not sure that you could really achieve uh, the design of curriculum without having some communication skills. Communication is important to uh, most everything uh, that we do. And uh, so these are just a few of the skills that would be necessary for uh, a design team in order to be effective. Doesn't mean that you have to have all of them in abundance, but that these are, are key areas where things can go wrong if you don't understand how people interact with one another and, and their strengths and weaknesses, that can be a problem. How to lead people and not drive them would also be valuable as a leadership skill. Well, to wrap up our discussion uh, in this uh, first uh, second module, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, instructional leaders in your school. How do you know that your uh, school principal is an instructional leader? What what r characteristics are uh, connected with instructional leadership? And that will be our discussion uh, this week. And I look forward to. 
uh, seeing you online and uh, answering questions and connecting with you on this important aspect of how do we process through the design of curriculum. As always, if you have questions, feel free to contact me by email and uh, look forward to working with you this week. Take care.